Tonight on Oxygen Tango Live, a visit all the way from Hawaii with Mr. Stuart Yurton. Welcome back to Oxygen Tango Live. Megan, how's it going? Dave, today I'm still a six. <laughs> six, I'm a okay. Of one to ten. <laughs> I'll give uh, I'll give myself a five. All right. We had uh, new intro music today. Hopefully, one that won't get uh, a copyright flag. Which which means we can save the chats for our videos and also possibly get some closed captioning going if I can ever figure it out but this is step number one is to not have copyright claim music so for the chuckleheads in the chat know that your chat can now be immortalized forever <laughs> um, so would you like to tell us uh, a little bit oh before before we go into today's guest let me just quickly mention we are streaming on Facebook and YouTube uh, if you want to get into the chat we recommend getting into the YouTube chat um, very occasionally the stream will end because of a technical issue. It'll usually start back up again shortly. Once in a while you'll have to go find it again, the new stream, but that hasn't happened in a long time. Also a good time to mention that we're interested in talking to tango dancers of any level all over the world to appear on the show. All you have to do is write us and let us know. We haven't turned down anybody yet. So who do we have tonight, Megan? Well, tonight... It's, we have a special guest. I actually had somebody write to request that we have Stuart on, which doesn't happen so often. So um, we're bringing Stuart on by popular demand from the tango community. Um, Stuart, some of you guys might recognize him. He um, lives in Hawaii, but he spent a month or so in Los Angeles and came to Oxygen quite a bit. It was really nice to have him around uh, for the time that he was here. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to talk to him tonight. He has an interesting job and lives in an interesting place. So I'm excited. We're going to continue our uh, uh, solo interview format, and it's Megan's turn to conduct the interview tonight. So without further ado, I will bow out, and here is Stuart Yurton. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Megan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, everything's great here. Oh, great. Yeah, I see the beautiful sunshine outside behind you. Yeah, it's a little, it's, a little, it's still light outside. We're getting sun setting, and it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's a little rainy here in our valley, but it's, uh, it's a beautiful day. I don't know if any of you, um, if you're friends with Stuart, you know he posts really just jaw-dropping tango videos against the most unimaginably beautiful backgrounds that you can imagine. I really enjoy them. Well, thanks. Yes, we figure the backgrounds at least can look spectacular, even though even if our dancing is is just uh, getting up to speed here. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so for those of you who don't know you, can you just situate yourself in the tango community? Um, how you came to tango, what your relationship was to tango, and the different roles that you might have played in it. Um, prior sure. to the pandemic and then what tango looks like for you right now. Sure, so I've been dancing about five years and uh, started here in Honolulu. Uh, it was uh, really kind of funny. Uh, someone suggested I, I uh, take up salsa because it would be a nice way to meet people and socialize. And I just looked online and saw this. I said, oh, this looks like what they're talking about. And I went to a tango class. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, was really great. I immediately got hooked. I love the people and the music and uh, started, this was at Paradise Tango, this little studio in Chinatown, and then branched out and really started going everywhere. Uh, we could here. We have a few people. With, uh, the Paradise Tango couple is Brett and Jenny Griswold, and they're great. And George Garcia is another teacher here who's excellent and started just taking classes with everybody. So uh, that was pretty much it. And then... Uh, as we do here, it's a small community, so we all play a lot of roles. So I then started eventually DJing under George's uh, 
uh, mentorship and uh, Alessia Valieva is another organizer. She helped me do that because we needed more people doing that. And that was pretty much it. We were chugging along. And uh, as you said, I came out there, visited you guys, learned a lot. I loved Oxygen, the amazing studio. And everybody in LA was super welcoming and, and nice. So uh, then came back here and was everything was going great. And then this hit, so we shut down. And like everybody else, I've been pretty much locked, locked in. Uh, we don't have anything going on here in person now. Uh, I've been taking classes of my partner, Patricia uh, Serafini, and I have been taking uh, classes together a lot with uh, Maxi Copello and Raquel Maco, and they have been, have been great teachers, on really great uh, online, and they have a whole curriculum for us that they're taking us through. And yeah, this, so that it's been really good. We've been growing a lot as, as dancers. Uh, even though we can't, uh, we can't do, go to milongas or anything. So. Yeah. So something that you did that is really interesting. So um, you competed in the Mundial this year, <laughs> which was a video submission only Mundial. Um, for for people watching that might not know, the Mundial is an annual um, global competition in um, Buenos Aires. Uh, it's typically done in person, um, but can you tell us a little bit about how it was done this year and your experience with it? Sure. So yes, that's right. It was it was all online, and uh, you had to dance to a uh, Darienzo song. It was Paciencia um, from 1937. Paciencia, with, uh, very apt for yeah. this time. <laughs> <laughs> a very apt song. And um, it was a beautiful version with a chahue and, and doing the vocals and, you know, a very classic song. And, uh, yeah, you, you, uh, we did it right here. You had to do it in your home. That was part of it. You were supposed to do it at your home, uh, just a video. They didn't want a fancy production. And uh, we, uh, we didn't really have a lot of time. So Maxi and Raquel have been, as part of their curriculum, they make us do videos occasionally, which is how we got started doing those videos um, that we've been posting. They would have us do it almost like it is an exam. Um, they would send us a song or something and say, okay, do a improvisation to this and videotape yourselves. So we were, we were used to that. And we had started Darienzo and we had our class and they said, okay, wait, wait, change of plans. There's this Mundial thing. We want you guys to do it. And wow. I know we just started Darienzo, so we're going to work on some things that you can do for the variation, and, and that's about all we have time for. And explain but, what the variation is for people. Oh, yeah, it's at the end. It's, the, it's a really fast, dynamic um, part of the song, especially that song. It's a classic Darienzo structure where it'll have, you know, verse, verse, and they'll have a uh, some kind of... Um, uh, vocal and then at the end we'll have this like two measures of this fast section um, so you know it can be a little confusing <laughs> and uh, and and uh, free as you know for me I would tend to freak out because the music gets very uh, seemingly chaotic uh, although it's not um, and there are just certain things that make more sense in that part so they taught us those and they said, okay, uh, you need to interpret it, but be cool and walk and, and do the variation. And, and that was about all we had time to do. So we did it. So how did it work? Did you all choreograph it or was it still like honor system supposed to be improvised or? Oh yeah, no, it wasn't really choreographed. It was pretty improvised. I mean, we, yeah. And we did, like I said, we didn't have tons of time to do lots of, uh, uh, versions because we can only have time to get together about once a week. And just the timing was such that we had limited time, but yeah. So we, I knew generally I had in my head ideas of what we would do at certain times. Um, and Maxi and Raquel were very like adamant about, okay, in certain times you really want to slow it down 
a lot, as much as possible to get a dynamic contrast between the more rhythmic sections of the song and um, and then the and, and then the other and then the slow part. So uh, yeah, that was pretty much um, all we did, and then the variation. So it was. Well, it how'd was, you do? Uh, we did we did well. We didn't <laughs> we weren't the worst. <laughs> <laughs> we were, but I think we were very happy that that we. Uh, we competed and uh, we 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 didn't like we got a score. It was it was good. It would have, you know, the scoring was tough, and it would have put us. You know, and I, I, we were maybe in the top. I don't know. I'm trying to think around. I was told you were in 67th place. That sounds about right, but <laughs> that's pretty good. Of, How many people yeah, were competing? Well, there were only like 80. <laughs> Still pretty good. Yeah, we weren't we weren't the worst. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I thought you were gonna say hundreds, but I no, still no. think 67 out of 80, not bad. Yeah, no, it was pretty good. But I will say this: if you looked at the scoring, and I think the scoring was was like just this is just what the score would have been if it had been the regular mundial with. 400 people we would have been more like 250 out of 400 so we wouldn't it wouldn't have put us into the semifinals or anything but it would have been and not in the middle even but it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been as far in the back cool you kind of get like a little taste of competition without the like very nerve-wracking part of of being live in front of a bunch of people Right, so that's the idea. We're getting used to that. They're 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 getting they're trying to get us used. The teachers are trying to get us used as much as they can to to any kind of pressure we can they can impose on us in this. Yeah, pandemic. it's a really useful um, teaching tool in a lot of ways. Like I I didn't really in, end up enjoying the competition world, but I did um, a competition here in LA and did like a a little program with Johnny Wynn leading up to it, training for it. And it was just a, it was a nice, like really tangible goal. And then, yeah, that pressure cooker of kind of being in front of people in the competition, I feel like it, yeah, almost, it, it does something. I think pressure cooker is the right word for it. I feel like it sort of levels you up in a way faster, like putting, putting that, putting that pressure on yourself and, and having to dance in front of other people. Yeah, and that's their, our teachers, uh, again, uh, Maxine and Raquel, that's their philosophy about it, that it's really about trying to put pressure on us to, to help us improve um, and stay calm, especially for me, because calmness is so important. So staying calm in more pressured situations um, is important. So this is a way, and it gives us something to work toward, too, so we have a little bit of pressure to to improve and, and work on our own and all that, even though we don't have milongas to go to or real competitions to go to. So it's giving us milestones. Do you think that you'll enter like in-person competitions now? Yeah, we want to. Yeah, we, we hope to when things open up again, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Neat. Um, all right, I want to do a, a hard 90 degree turn and uh, want to ask you a little bit about your life outside of tango. Um, sure. First, I'm wondering if you can, so how did you come to live in Hawaii? Are you from there or? No, my, my ex-wife is from here. So oh, she's okay. from here, she's a, from a lo long generate, multi-generation you know, generation family going way back. Um, from here and, and really wanted to come back here. We had two kids and she wanted to be back, so we moved here. So that was it. And then we split up, but I stayed because we have the kids and, you know, didn't, didn't want to Not a bad life. Away. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you are a journalist um, working for the Honolulu Civil Beat? Civic. Yeah. Civil Beat, yeah. Civil Beat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Covering business and economics economics and then got yeah. pulled into health department 
reporting. Um, So we'll get into like the stuff that you're currently reporting on, but how did you come to be a a journalist? So, well, I always liked writing um, and it seemed like the way to make a living (laughs) rather than trying to be a a novelist or a poet or something. So, uh, so I got into it and, uh, just in college and, uh, you know, did the, did the thing, I worked at, it was an English major, worked at the newspaper in, in my town and, uh, moved on and did other stuff and moved to New York and, and all that. And, um, Ended up for the longest and, and worked at a really great uh, magazine called The American Lawyer. We did investigative reporting on law firms, which was kind of crazy. And um, and then ended up in New Orleans for the long for a big bulk of years um, doing uh, business reporting there in New Orleans for a long time. It was a great great time for the Times Picayune. Um, ended up moving out here and everything kind of fell apart. The in, our industry sort of falling apart the, the uh, journalism industry yeah you know newspapers were really having a hard time and i it was really hard to see a future um anywhere uh and so i ended up going back to school and when i went to law school and uh became a lawyer <laughs> and worked for the government here for a while and was planning to get another law job i kind of had this i was at the end of my time with this job uh, working for the state and this uh, civil D job just kind of fell into my lap and I started looking and this was one it, it seemed like a really good fit and very stable good news good journalism and uh, our backer is is uh, or publisher is the uh, Piero Midiar the founder of eBay so we're very stable financially, but we're a nonprofit. So we get a lot of donations and stuff too from people it's, and, and grants. So a lot of our work is grant funded and it's just very, it's, it's, un, it's kind of a unicorn in journalism, uh, especially out here. So that was why Meaning did it. you're not as like dependent on advertising. Oh no, we're not dependent at all on advertising and we're stable and we can do good enterprise reporting. We have a, po- a really good podcast. What does that mean, enterprise reporting? Oh, oh, kind of like, well, people might call it investigative, but it's more things where you take more time and you seek out um, seek out stories. And instead of being reactive, you try to be a little bit more proactive. People okay. sometimes refer to it as investigative, but that's more a very specific type of enterprise reporting. So enterprise reporting would be broader and you could have even feature reporting that was enterprise, just, you know, really cool, uh, long form pieces would be enterprise reporting. So that's, that's what we do. And I'm really lucky to be here. Really grateful to have this job uh, doing this. My colleagues are super smart and yeah, it's really great. That's great. All right. So what's what's life as a journalist in Hawaii during the pandemic like right now? What what are the what are the big stories you're working on? Yeah, it's it's super busy. Uh super, super busy. Um and you know, it's probably the stories are similar everywhere. Uh for a while here, the big story that we really jumped on and, and pushed hard on involved our failed contact tracing effort. You know, for a long time, we had zero, we had almost zero cases here um, by May. It was like none. Like we would have the seven day average would be like one to new, new to two new cases a day. And now what we, were the restrictions at that time? How are they accomplishing that? Um, we had a, we had things pretty much closed down. Um, but we and, and but it, it was okay for a while when we started reopening, but we were supposed to have this huge team of just you know it's the same routine like everywhere uh, a huge team of contact tracers, uh, screen testing capacity, getting people to isolate if they tested positive, so we could keep things in clusters. And as we started opening up, uh, things were going out of con- went out of control, and we started 
poking around and learned that we had nothing near the number of contact tracers the Department of Health, the director, said uh, they would hire. And we, we kept pushing it and, and, and really pushing it. And finally, this whistleblower came forward and said, yeah, this is what's going on. We've got like nothing near what they are said and nothing near what even they're claiming now. We're overwhelmed. We're working all the time and can't keep up with it. And um, we really were leading that story. It's not a huge market here, but it's pretty competitive. And I'll say Civil Beat did a good job of, of, of really owning that story, as we would say as the journalist. And um, eventually the health department director retired and the epidemiologist uh, was put on leave. And so they're gone. And these are the people they think were like in charge of not doing this. And they well, probably- so, well, Yeah, it. what was their, why, what, was somebody trying to save money? Was- We still don't really know, I mean, it sounds like they just, we don't know. So it would be pure speculation on my part. I mean, the one thing I can say is early on, we were reporting on this as well. Uh, as the reopening was about to start happening, all of these people were coming forward from the University of Hawaii, uh, the National Guard, and others were saying, we have contact tracing staff trained. We will give them to the Department of Health please accept our help. And the mayor of Honolulu, so this was the state level health department, but the mayor of Honolulu was saying, we need hundreds of these people and we don't have enough. That was in May. And the, uh, ep the epidemiologist and health director were turning, turning down all this help. Um, and then finally- Why? So the health department director said, we can surge from within. This is the term he used. We'll surge from within. We can train people from within the health department to be contact tracers. We don't want to accept outside help. Um, again, that was the best explanation we can we could How get. How strange. It's like the strangest motivational slogan I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, surge from within. Surge from within. <laughs> I will tell you this, though. This is something, and this, this speaks to the state epidemiologist and what we've heard about her style. And this is something that I was finally able to publish, but it was way after the fact that I finally got it into Civil Beat and another story. I sort of look back six months into this. Back in January, as this was starting to you know, become apparent, how bad this pandemic was, a doctor here, a medical doctor, sent the epidemiologist, doc, another doctor, Sarah Park, an article um, from the BBC, from China, from Wuhan, saying, look, this is a lot worse than people think. So he wrote to the epidemiologist and said, are we gonna test and scream? Um, this looks pretty bad. And she wrote back this very uh, terse, uh, email saying, nope, no need, we don't have flights from China, which uh, we don't have direct flights from China, which I'm not even sure that's true, but what really put people off was this sort of flippant tone and almost dismissive attitude of like, well, no, you don't really know anything. It seems to be a recurring theme right? with this so, person. Yeah, so that was something that got out and uh, that we, you know, we had, but I, like I said, I was having trouble getting it published um, and we finally got it. So that, that says something, I think, about Dr. Park, who, and, and it's more of a personality thing, I believe, uh, than anything to do with her skill. She's very intelligent and capable. But I, I yeah, don't it sounds know. like like some deep seated like interpersonal issues almost. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and pretty deep seated to to override, you know, yeah, the impending yeah. doom of a pandemic. I mean, well, right, and you know, if you think about it, if somebody's in the uh, that kind of position, they really need like per personal skills, media skills. You know, if you think of like needing 
you know, what we really needed was a Dr. Fauci for Hawaii who would come out and talk to people and not get, uh, not get uh, uh, condescending if people ask stupid questions. And I just think, uh, you know, some people don't suffer fools easily and uh, maybe Dr. Park was one of those people and it, it would be fine in a certain setting, but it, it didn't serve us well here in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I take back that it's not an interpersonal issue so much as like it almost feels like she felt personally threatened by the idea that she couldn't handle it all on her own. I don't know. I, like I said, I, I really don't know. Um, I just know that they, um, you know, they, they were removed or one voluntarily removed, uh, left or retired, and the other uh, moved on, uh, was put on leave. And a new group of people came in, and it seems to be better now. But you know, again, we went from we went from one to like virtually no cases a day to then 300 and 50 or something, which for us is a lot. I know it's not a lot for you guys there, but, but and now we're back down. We had another shutdown because of it. Um, and oh, so you all had opened up a bit. Yeah, we opened up and then it, everything ballooned when it was supposed to be under control. And, you know, remember we have this, we had this quarantine on travel to Hawaii. So our whole economy was, so much of our economy depends on tourists and it's been wrecked. I mean, our, we've, we and Nevada are suffering like some of the worst economic uh, strain because of this. And because um, the tourism industry was shut down, we, we weren't, you, in order to come here, whether you're a re returning resident or a tourist, you needed to quarantine for two weeks. So nobody would want to come here. You, know, you quarantine the whole your whole vacation and then go home. Yeah. So the idea was, hey, we have no cases now. Let's open up locally first, and then um, we'll have this testing and tracing and everything in place. We'll let tourists come back. Maybe have a system where they test ahead of time, so we t screen out a lot of people. They come here. We can trace people who. And locals, because a lot of the spreads locally, when we'll keep everything under control. And that just didn't happen. We never got to the point where we could reopen for tourists um, until now, just this month. It fi we finally got things back under control again. So, you know, this was, I mean, you had people, of course, you had people getting sick and dying. Um, but we also have people really suffering because of the because of they're out of work. And, and remember all of this was happening also as the, the PPP money was sort of running out over the summer. So all that money dried up. And then the plus up on the unemployment insurance, right? The $600 a week that people were getting, that was running out too. So we were really heading to this, to this economic cliff as we were hoping to reopen. But we couldn't reopen because we didn't have the testing and tracing systems in place and instead of it being kind of leveling off and then we reopen and we can host a lot of people and not worry um it just we could it blew up and we couldn't do it and you know you you know bear in mind like at its peak at its peak tourism last year we would have so we have a population statewide of like one let's say 1.4 million and sorry people. and by state you mean honolulu so no, like no, no. state refers to the island no, the island chain yeah all oh all the, the whole island. the whole state got yeah. it the whole state we would have population of 1.4 or so million i think um but we would have 250,000 tourists a day on top of that so oh. So it would equal like one sixth of our population, right? Wow. Would 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 on top would be tourists, right? So it's a lot of people um, that would have. So you know, no one expected it to go back to that level immediately or anytime soon. But we could conceivably have had a lot of people coming, and we really wanted to have the capacity in place to deal with to deal with these people. 
And, and you know, if somebody got sick here, we would need the hospital space for them, plus hospitals for us, testing capacity for them and us. So it was really a, a, a pretty significant failure uh, not to execute this plan. And if it had worked, you know, maybe it wouldn't have worked, right? So we don't know that. We don't know if, if this, if we don't know for sure that if we had had, you know, three, 500 contact tracers and, you know, sitting around uh, that it would have worked. But, you know, I think of it, I think of the whole contact tracing thing is like, it's like the, um, it, it's like the, the, the state, the, the stadiums, like the college football stadium, like what do you have the Coliseum there and the Memorial say, whatever. So, you know, yeah. It's empty most of the time. It's like the con yeah, the contract tracers would be sitting around. But when you have you know UCLA and USC play, and you have a hundred thousand people show up, you can't build the stadium then. Right. And so that's kind of what I think they were going to do with the contact tracers. It was like, well, let's just wait till we have a surge, and then we'll grow to meet the demand, meet the surge, but it didn't happen. So we never really had a chance to see if that system would work when we had like, like I'm saying, let's just say one case a day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was like, okay, what, if, what would happen? And then the idea was we'll be the safest place in the world. Everybody will want to come to Hawaii because they'll know, hey, I can go to Hawaii and nobody has COVID there. But we never had the chance to allow that to happen. Were there any states who had their shit together with contact tracing that you know of? Well, not really. I mean, you know, the not, I don't, I don't know. It's been, obviously it's been a, I mean, people know it's been a problem everywhere. Um, and, I, but I think, you know, part of the thing is it's so challenging, right? If you have a bunch of cases and, and, and community spread, it's really hard to get, for them to get their arms around it, right? But if you yeah. have one case or 10 cases or 20, I think that's possible then. And we could have been an experiment to see if it would work. Could we do it? Yeah. Now, out, out, could we do it in a, outside, in a place where there's, that's not like, you know, Taiwan or China? or something where there's, you know, different culture and, you know, they had experience with, with viruses before. So they had really good right. systems in place. What's the situation right now um, in Honolulu and, and Hawaii at large? Yeah. I mean, are you all totally shut down? Is no. it? No, we're, we're opening up. Uh, restaurants are open. Bars are still, bars and some other businesses are still closed. Restaurants are open. Uh, the beaches are all open. We're supposed to have limits of groups of five people. Um, for social for, gatherings? Yeah, for social gatherings. Um, for You can go, you know, supposedly going to the beach with five people. You know, we, we have people violating that a lot. You're supposed to wear a mask outside, which we didn't really know. <laughs> so we've been doing these videos. We didn't realize, wait, we're really supposed to be wearing a mask outside even if we have a bubble? <laughs> so uh wearing masks um wait what do you mean when you when you have a bubble you mean like a little yeah. bubble of contacts that you all well, are yeah yeah of? yeah because patricia and i are kind of in a bubble like i don't see anybody else really uh right. or any people at all like <laughs> i mean yeah. i work from home mostly and she's does too and it's just very limited but even with that, we're supposed to be wearing a mask if we're together in public, Dan I guess dancing, yeah. So um, anyway. So yeah, I've been surprised with, uh, I just feel like the messaging overall, like I know in LA, I'm just very unclear what's going on. <laughs> like you can look up statistics and things, but like for right now, for instance, I, I don't know if there's any rules governing social gatherings. Should we not be having any? Are we allowed to have up to five people? Like, uh, it seems kind of crazy to me. It just feels, it feels like there's nobody up there, <laughs> I guess. I mean, I know that there's certainly like things being put in place and regulations for businesses and things, but it just doesn't seem like there's really 
sort of clear clear messaging for people and like uh, giving people a clear idea of like what they should and should not be doing. And yeah. I think that's leading to a lot of confusion. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, along with people who just personally, you know, it's it, does, it doesn't feel as scary to them. They're maybe not coming into contact with vulnerable people. Um, but yeah, I think a part of it is just, there's not a lot of just hard and fast, like, all right, this is what I, it felt like it more at the beginning of the pandemic. Cause it was really clear. Everybody just has to stay home unless you absolutely yeah. have to go out, but it's so nebulous now. Yeah. It's, it's the same here. Uh, even the point, my, my colleague, Christina Jadra is the one who just reported. Nobody was aware of this, that if you're in a household, so you're in the same household or you're in the bubble or whatever, um, and you go in public, you're supposed to be wearing masks. <laughs> no one knew that. People thought, "What?" That was so. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same here. Um, and so there is it. So you've got LA County, which is really big, and then you guys have a bunch of municipalities. Like, so where do you live? I where live you- in like on the west side of LA. Okay. Is it so? A for, is it what? Is, it a muni- is there a municipality where you live? I don't the- think so. I mean, when when I look at guidelines, um, it just asks me what county I live in. Okay. It doesn't break it down by municipality. And LA County is not doing well. We're basically on the the most lockdown of any of the other. Okay. Counties. So maybe it's on the county level where they set the rules, and then you would do it. Because here it's county. Like each island is essentially a county. So we're Honolulu County. And, and, and our orders are done for the county. So ours are different from, say, Maui. Yeah. Got it. Um, we have a comment from the chat, a question from the chat, if you'd be sure. willing to take it. Sure. From Sachin Mehta. Um, I'm not going to know how to pronounce that. Um, he wants to know if you know how Nihao is affected. I don't. That's a really good Hi, question. Kevin? I we have not. I haven't seen any reporting from that. That's an excellent. What's, question. what's Nihau? Nihau is in Nihau. one of the other islands. A very small island. It's one of our tiny islands. I don't know. I didn't That's even a know great that. Question. We should. I'll. I'll look into it. Well, we should make Sachin look into it and let us know. Well, which we'll <laughs> look. Yeah. Um, excellent. Thank you. So, okay, I do want to, um, I have a couple, like, more lighthearted things that I want to get into right at the end, but I do want to ask you, um, so you worked for a Native Hawaiian nonprofit in law school, um, and that nonprofit was one of the people who helped bring a suit in what's become a very famous um, protest and um act of resistance by the by indigenous people in Hawaii um, concerning the site of uh, Mauna Kea. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just giving us the background on 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 what the issue is and, and sort of what's going on now. Sure. Yeah. So this is one of the this is our Hawaii's big protest movement. Um, it's been going on for several years uh, and it, uh, the organization that you mentioned, it was, I was a legal fellow, excuse me, legal fellow in law school. So I worked with them over the summer. We didn't really work on this. This was a little, a little, only a little bit. This was just starting then. Um, but they kind of brought lawsuits. So, so the issue is that a consortium, an international consortium of astronomy organizations, including government science, uh, institutes and, and universities and others, um, have been trying to build this, what they call the 30 meter telescope. And it's called the 30 meter telescope because it has a giant mirror that's like 30 meters in diameter. Um, it's not just one mirror, it's actually multiple mirrors and they can move around and stuff. But it captures a lot of light um, and they want to put it on top of Mauna Kea, which is the mount, uh, volcano in on the big island. And it's one of uh, it's a, considered a sacred site by Native Hawaiians. It also happens to be supposedly it also happens to be one of the best places in the world to put observatories. So, the, and that's the problem. There are already a, a dozen or so observatories up there, um, and some of them probably aren't. Some of them are supposed to be decommissioned, so deconstructed, and, and taken down. 
Uh, and then, so on top of that, uh, they wanted to put in yet another one. And I think it was, for a lot of people, it was the final straw. There were some issues with uh, permitting and some other legal issues. I, I, I don't want to speak to those because I'd have to read again exactly what the problems were. But there were a number of, of legal issues involving the land use and the permitting for the telescope. So Kahea uh, fought those and, and won on one case. Um, and then it went back to the Hawaii Supreme Court eventually. And why, and, why do people not want observatories? Uh, like who doesn't and why? Well, like I said, it, it's... I, it's considered a sacred site by native Hawaiians and by, by many, some people say, no, it's not. But if you look, if you look at the mountain, there've been uh, uh, archeological surveys and stuff done. And there's quite a bit of uh, indication that people viewed this as a sacred site. Uh, not, it's not just a new idea and it's, you know, it's insulting. I mean, it, it's the idea and it's because it's a natural place, you know, you, you know, bear in mind, I mean, this is a gorgeous place. It's a, it, it lives up to the height. It's incredibly gorgeous. And it's, it's a land, you know, the Hawaii, like many uh, native indigenous people, you know, it's a land-based culture and land-based uh, society. Um, and there's that, and so there's a great deal of respect for the environment here. You know, we, are we in the Hawaii state constitution? Um, one of the fundamental rights is a right to a clean and healthy environment that's in the constitution. Um, so, and this is part of the native Hawaiian ethos that really pervades um, the place. I mean, we all, if you, it's hard not to cherish the environment here when you go out and see how spectacularly beautiful it is. And there's so, also, correct me if I'm wrong, I know a native, a lot of a Native American um, culture, not just like a reference for the land, but a belief that it's alive, that, that, that there's, that, that the mountain has a spirit, that the river has a spirit, that, that there's, there's, um, yeah, that it's not, not just like the land itself, but that there's, there's like, beings. I mean, not, that's going to start yeah. sounding kooky, well, but that, that those things are literally alive and have the same rights as people. Well, so, and this, is, so this is, this is all speaks to uh, what an offense it was to a lot of people that they're doing more telescopes up there. And, you know, one of my, the, my, my boss at the time uh, at Kahea was like, yeah, this is like, if you, what if you told somebody we're, we're going to build a giant telescope or put a giant observatory on top of your church or on top of Notre Dame or something. So even though it's natural and not a building, it was the equivalent of that to people. And um, so they, and it, it sort of took on a, something bigger. It was like, this is, this is a, um, this is some, this is a movement. This is something we really want to fight for and protect. I mean, one of the things to, to bear in mind is that there's a really good legal argument you can make, and I won't go into it, but that, that Hawaii is, is illegally occupied by the United States. Right. So, so, and it has to do with, it has to do with the treaties and which were signed under the rest and stuff like that. But, the point is, is that there are a lot of people who believe with good reason that this is actually illegally occupied. Yeah, I mean, easy to believe from the United huh? States government. An easy thing to believe from the yeah. United States and, government. And, and, and like I said, there's, it's, 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 a, it's not people just making it up. So, so when you put it, and there's a you know, history of colonization and... Um, overthrow the monarchy and everything. So yeah, it's, it, it's understandable uh, that this t has taken on a greater, um, uh, it's almost symbolic uh, 
of, of attention that must be ever present, I would think, between an indigenous culture and sort of, you know, a capitalistic. Yeah. Um, yeah, for a lot of, yeah, for a lot of people, it, it is for sure. And like I said, understandably so. Um, at the same time, I mean, one of the cool things about Hawaii is, like I said, I mean, you have this right to a clean and healthful environment that's in the state constitution. Um, you have certain gathering rights in Hawaii that, um, one of, so one of the big fundamental ideas of, well, you know, they talk about property rights as a bundle of sticks, right? So if you own property, you have all these rights. And one of the main ones, usually under Western law, um, going back to like England, you know, is the right to exclude people from your land. No trespassing, right? You know, that, that idea. You can keep people off your land. Well, in Hawaii, there's something, one thing that, um, that, that is, is uh, more powerful than the right to exclude, an exception to that. It's not absolute, but an exception is Native Hawaiian gathering. So if you own land and, and it's not developed and certain other factors and a native Hawaiian person wants to go gather ferns for, you know, hakulays like headlays, or they want to gather salt from a tide pool, a salt pool or shrimp or any number of things that are traditional native Hawaiian activities, it can be done. And that's part of our law, you know? Wow. So, yeah. So unlike, you know, so on the mainland and in, in like U.S. law, you have a whole section of like, you know, they call it Indian law. Like it's a whole, right? I mean, I know it's not really Native Hawaiian, American would be the term, but they call it Indian law because that's what it's called. And it's separate. It's like a separate body of laws. Here, a lot of these things are woven into, into the law, either by statute or by uh, precedent. Um and stuff like that. So it, it's, it, it's interesting. I mean, there's still a long way to go and there's a lot of, uh, can you, can you speak just a little bit about what the, the resistance looked like? Like what, what, what would, what were the native Hawaiians? There was a, a real, if, for anybody well, that's listening, the, I really you highly, did a lot of research. you did a lot of research. I did. Yeah. What struck you about it? I'm curious from someone, you know, from your perspective, looking at it, you know, because people were going to the mountain, they were camping out and stuff. But tell me what, what struck yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, and it became what? a sort of a permanent community and encampment um, in which people stayed up there through terrible storms. Um, and for, I think, I don't know if it was years, but the, the sort of iteration that I was reading about was months and months and months. Um, and they had an entire, you know, they had schools and child care and meal prep and... Um, you know, it was a really beautiful just, you know, saying we're not going to let this happen and we're not going to leave. And, yeah, so for anybody listening, it's it's, called, it's spelled M-A-U-N-A and then the second word is K-E-A. I highly recommend going in and reading up about it. It's inspiring. Um, uh, but, yeah, I'm just curious. So what, where did it get them? What's the, what's the status right now? It's on hold. It's on hold, and there's a lot of controversy about that. I mean, the governor here has not pushed it, um, and some people say, "Well, wait, they got all their, they went through the port, and the, the developers of the telescope went through everything, and you should be pushing it." But yeah, it's on hold now. There's nothing, there's nothing going on. So on hold because of COVID, or on hold because the the protesters succeeded. I'm to, you know, it's, this is a good question. Um, I think because of the protesters, I mean, maybe COVID, I, COVID's affecting it. You know, when, when this happened, it was something we were following <laughs> a lot more closely. And suddenly this came along and everything, everything uh, changed. So we should look back and see exactly what is going on. <laughs> that's a good question. Th thanks for humoring me. I know I'm grilling you on something that's not... Uh, current yeah, area no, of expertise, it's, it's really. Good, no, no, it's a good question. We need to look back, but like I said, this has been such a major distraction and change for everything. So, yeah. um, okay, I have two items left for you. <laughs> uh, the first is actually a question from Dave, um, and it is 
Uh, did Larry Ellison really buy the sixth biggest Hawaiian island? And how do you feel about that? Uh, the short the answer is yes. He bought it. How can you buy part of a state? Well, this is a good question. Um, so yes. Wait, and who's Larry Ellison? Uh, the or founder of Oracle Software. Oh, I see. Sounds yeah. shady. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> Ellison bought the island. Um, but see, the island was owned by this guy named Murdoch before, because the island was owned. Rupert Murdoch? No, no. What, what's Murdoch's? I can't remember Murdoch's first, first name, but um, owned by this guy Murdoch, who owned one of the plantations. So it was a plantation. It was a pineapple um, plantation, and it was all owned by. Might have been, might have been Dole. I can't remember. Anyway, it was, it was owned by a plantation company, pineapple company. This guy Murdoch ended up taking control of that, so it was already pretty much owned. And like everything, the infrastructure, all of these things are owned privately, and they have like they have their own utilities. They're still regulated by like the Public Utilities Commission, which is our utility regulator, but they're privately owned. Um, water system. I don't know if the electric system. Anyway, so it was already owned um, privately. And yeah, Ellison came in and bought it. And yeah, it's it's really pretty strange. Um, <laughs> Sounds it. Yeah, it's pretty strange, the, that situation. Um, there's not a there's not a lot there. It's pretty much the, you know, there's a hotel that was a four seasons, um, where, uh, Bill Gates got married <laughs> by the way. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. It was a really beautiful, uh, place. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a cool, one cool thing about it though, about Lanai is that you can, uh, camp, you can camp there. There's a great campground at Manelli Bay. So you can go get over. You've got it's kind of hard. The logistics are hard because you got to get your food and everything. And if you don't have a car, you got to figure out how to get to the store and then bring your food down. But camp in this beautiful bay, and it's the beach where this hotel uses. So you're like camping out and you know paying nothing, and the people from the hotel are paying a fortune to stay there, and you're in the same place. And they're dolphins, they're little spinner dolphins that are in the bay. You can kind of swim with them they they'll get pretty close to you and kind of play with you um wow sounds beautiful larry ellison's a, a lucky man yeah but you can, the point is you can still go there i mean you, you it's not like it's not like a private island i mean it's right. a whole town people live there they grow up there their house there's there's private i guess there are people yeah i think you can there has to be private owned there's private homes but not many I, I, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I I don't know. It's a strange. It's a strange, you know, still plantation sort of atmosphere, from what I hear. Uh, I, I can tell you one thing. I can tell you is that it's it is kind of hard to report on on that place because of it. Um, there's a oh. lot. Of, yeah, I haven't tried to, but. One of my cop four Maybe people colleagues. like don't want to touch it because they'll get pissed off. Yeah, it's a very small, you know, oh. really small. Yeah, it's kind of hard uh, to get to crack what's really going on there from people on the record sometimes. But at least that's what I've heard. Um, so are yeah. there are there whispers of like nefarious doings or like trouble over there? Or? Not really. He, you know, he was doing this. Um, he was doing these massive, uh, like, um, greenhouses, like, and growing, like, aquaponic crops and trying to do this something with, like, health and wellness and stuff. But, they're, again, they're not... It's you know, all in this, like, kind of veil of secrecy. To yeah, it, there's a little strange. bit of a veil of secrecy, and it's hard to figure out. I mean... I think if you knew, yeah, it's a little, it's a little hard to figure out. I see. 
Um, okay, well, I can't thank you enough for letting me just pepper you with a <laughs> bajillion questions about all that. Um, I would Why love to... <laughs> what? Yeah, I hope I didn't go on for too long. <laughs> no, 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 the hour flew by. Um, so I would love to close. So I, I, I as is my... As is my um, want, I always social media and internet stalk people as much as I can before these interviews. And I just, I came across a really gorgeous poem on your Facebook page that you had written, I think, in memoriam for a yeah. friend of yours. And then yeah. we got to talking about that. And it turns out that you write quite a bit of poetry. And you agreed to read a short one for us. And I wonder yeah. if you still might be willing and if we can sure. use that to kind of close us out. Sure. Yes. I'll, yes. That's I'm I'm honored. And yes, my my friend. It, it, um, yes, I wrote that one for him. But this is one for uh, teachers, and um, I won't explain the theme, but uh, it's universal for all teachers, and it's called "To All Teachers." This is the best you said. Food, dancing, beautiful places, summer. You advised me in a message from your room where you've been locked for 50 years now, isolated for eternity, painting hyacinths and jasmine on your walls with incense and the juice of wild berries and the, your blood and bones, folding paper birds that flit and fly across your studio, fluttering cellophane butterflies and dancing, always dancing. The way you taught me to dance in that attic in Buenos Aires, in a villa, with tall windows and a balcony crawling with ivy, a building full of people, but only us in the attic, with the gray light and the wood floor, two people learning to walk. And now you're a tiger in a mausoleum, and outside, I'm outside sharing these steps you taught me with another on the beach at sunset, an ocean away from you. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Megan. Thanks so much for really having nice. me on the on the show. It's really an honor, and I'm I'm glad someone asked. I'm going to ask you later who who suggested it. It was Kimberly Wang. I'll add oh, her right in. Oh, so, <laughs> so thank you, Kimberly Wang, for bringing us that beautiful hour. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Um, all right. I can't think of a better way to end it. Thank you for sharing about your work and your life and also for sharing a little bit of your soul and your poetry with us. Okay. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. See you soon. Talk to you soon. Good night, everybody.